Committee. I just wanted to say a word or two for those of you who have not been with us before for a Sheila Hutzler Reeves Memorial uh, Lecture. Uh, we have two lectures a year um, that are made possible by a memorial gift, a wonderful gift that was given to us by Ellie Trowbridge, who was a member of the board of the Berman Institute and also a member of the board, the advisory board for the Bloomberg School of Public Health. Uh, Sheila Hutzler is uh, Ellie's daughter, and uh, they lost Ellie at a young age uh, to uh, cancer, and Ellie wanted very much for us to do something uh, that would uh, help people think hard about ethical issues uh, related to the end of life. And uh, what she ended up doing was leaving us a, a wonderful request that allows us to bring a very distinguished uh, scholar, practitioner from outside of Hopkins to join us twice a year to uh, probe and, and provoke and challenge us to think uh, perhaps uh, more or differently than we, many of us, already do about these issues. So I always want to take a moment before we begin this lecture to remember uh, Sheila Hutzler Reeves and also um, also very much her mother Ellie, who is very dear to uh, a number of us in this room and very special to John Hopkins. So with that, Cinda. Thank you, Ruth. It's uh, indeed a pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Sarah Shannon. Sarah is a nurse, and she is an associate professor uh, at the University of Washington in the School of Nursing in the Department of Behavioral Health and Health Systems, and she's also adjunct faculty in the Department of Bioethics and Humanities. And she has done uh, incredible work in terms of ethics consultation, has served in quite a number of ethics committees uh, in her area and also has uh, been involved in interprofessional work and uh, most notably recently as uh, on the board of the American Society for Bioethics and Humanities. She has also uh, done quite a lot of research focusing on communication and most recently she has some NIH funded uh, work looking at conflict among team members uh, in an interprofessional context. But a lot of her work has really uh, been focused on the ethical issues and the intersection of bioethics and clinical practice and palliative care at the end of life. So we are extremely delighted to have her with us today. So I ask you to join me in welcoming Sarah Shannon. Thank you very much. I was thrilled to be offered the opportunity to not do a death by PowerPoint and instead to have the chance to do more of a TED style talk. So many thanks to Dr. Faden and to Cinda, my good friend, um, Dr. Rushton, um, for your kind introductions and the opportunity to give this talk. Uh, this is an issue that is near and dear to uh, my, both my ethics practice and my clinical practice. Um, I graduated from nursing school in 1982, and at that time, I immediately found myself focusing on care of patients and their families at the end of life, first in a regular acute care type setting, also inpatient hospice, and then later in the critical care setting. Now, in 1980, it seemed that we had a huge problem around end-of-life care. Um, we were focusing our attention at that time um, on the issues of living wills, of informing patients about DNR orders, about with the, the legalities around withholding and withdrawing of life-sustaining care. At that time, 54% of Americans were dying in hospitals. And we saw that as a failure of our systems. This was the era of the right to die. These were the cases that were in the, on the front pages of the newspapers were the Karen M. Quinlan case, the Nancy Cruzan case, the Paul Brophy case. Well, today, more Americans die at home or in a nursing home, but 20% 
will die in the ICU, that's one in five, or very soon after an ICU admission, 20%. <coughs> this is more than in 1980. So today we've moved from the challenge of patients and families asking us for the right to die to the challenge of patients and families demanding the right to live. And we've moved from those cases I said before to the cases of Terry Scheibel, Barbara Howe, and most recently, Jaheem McMath. So we in ethics need to consider this collective voices that are asking for more at the end of life. In 1980, white and black Americans' location of death was the same, whether they died in a hospital, a nursing home, or at home. The proportions were the same. Now, there is a growing disparity of the location for dying with more African Americans choosing to die in hospitals and ICUs. So our view of end of life and of communication around end of life is riddled with myths. And what I'd like to do today is to look at a few of those most important myths. So the first one, most people in the United States want to die at home. How many of you believe that? Of course, I already told you it was a myth, so it's kind of sad. <laughs> okay, well, most of, us, most of us do believe that, but here's the problem. And this is based on two issues that a colleague in um, Southampton, UK, Julia Addington Hall, a professor of nursing there who's done extensive research in this area, has identified. First, if you look at the research, most is often what I like to think of as the 51% phenomenon. It's most, but it is by no means the vast majority. So that's the first problem. So while it's technically true, it ignores the near half that, that do not prefer home as the location of death. Now the second is that there is consistent research across all disease groups with patients and with their care caregivers that shows a consistent pattern. And that is that the closer one gets to death and the more symptoms increase, the more people's preferences for location of death shifts to inpatient settings. Now, we can say, well, that's a failure of hospice, but I just want to point out, many people do not opt for a home birth either. We can call it the laundry factor, we can call it the fear factor, but we should acknowledge it and think about how to address this very real set of preferences. Okay, second myth. Do you believe this one? So what is the good death? What's a good death? The absence of a lot of pain and suffering. So not having pain at the end of life. Okay, absence of pain. What else? Dignity. Dignity. Time and opportunity for closure. Time for closure. We tend to define a good death among healthcare community and certainly among ethics as quick, Painless, few tubes, loved ones at our bedside. But here's another definition. <coughs> Everything possible was done. A good fight. No stone left unturned. Fought until the end. Those are also definitions of good death that are widely held in America. So this myth suggests that if we just complete advanced directives, if we just get people to do that, then our end of life issues will be addressed. However, there is little evidence that if we 
that advanced directives reduce the number of deaths in the ICU, affect cost of care at the end of life, et cetera. And furthermore, there was a very well-researched, well-designed study done, this is Phelps 2009 JAMA, that found that people, people with higher positive religious coping scores, in fact, were more likely to die with ventilation at the end of life, more likely to die with more days spent in the ICU, regardless, they had the same amount of hospice, same amount of referral to hospice. So what's going on? Well, multiple definitions of the good death. And these definitions are not randomly distributed across the population, but in fact, preferences for aggressive care at the end of life are more likely to be shared among African Americans, Native Americans, people with that research term, greater religiosity, and among the poor. And these groups are increasing in the US. So myth number three. This is our favorite one. The problem is them, not us. We just need to educate people to not want everything. And then we'll take care of the end of problem at uh, end of life. We need to convince them to complete an advance directive and we will address this issue of decision making at the end of life. There's a, some truth to this. Um, Bud Haynes, he's a nurse who has shown the only success around advanced directives, the only true success through his initiative in um, La Crosse, Wisconsin, where he has a community initiative that views advanced care planning as a process with three stages that ends in a post form, or that, that the final stage is a post form. And that's the only initiative that has truly shown change. But what's different about that? A post form is not an advanced directive. A post form are orders for care. A post form is evidence that an informed consent discussion has occurred between the physician or the nurse practitioner and the patient or their surrogate. It's a very different process. So in general, having an advanced directive or a living will does not reduce the intensity of treatment that is received at the end of life. We need to start this conversation from a different place. So, myth number four, last myth. Clinicians know how to effectively communicate around end of life decisions. Okay, how many of you believe that? <laughs> I thought you'd be a pretty sophisticated audience and would know this one was a myth. Well, you know, there's so many studies I could have chosen from, but I want to choose my favorite. Uh, my colleague in Seattle, Tony Bach, is probably the best communications researcher in the United States. Does incredible communication, intensive communication skills training. Um, he conducted a four-day residential, rigorous communication skills workshops for oncology fellows. So these are advanced learners. Now the good news, the intervention was successful in improving these specialist skills around delivering bad news, around discussing the transition to palliative care, around talking about dying. So what's the bad news? The success, the way they measured success included that before the training, 16% of the oncologists used the word cancer when giving bad news, and afterward, afterwards, 54% said cancer when telling a simulated patient that they had cancer. So while it's definitely a positive effect and, and a very strong one, there's room for improvement. Oncologists are not unique. <clears throat> Research with pulmonary and critical care physicians 
cardiologists, surgeons, and others affirm just what you have guessed. And that is, communication about end of life is tough talk. And nurse practitioners are no better at it. So, what has improved patient outcomes around end of life? You know, it's challenging to even ask this question as a researcher because the first thing you can't use is mortality as an outcome. Um, you can consider ICU length of stay for patients who ultimately do not survive hospitalization, but again, you're looking at preferences. You can also look at PTSD, post-traumatic stress disorder, because we now realize that families suffer terribly when a loved one dies, particularly in the ICU, with 70% having clinical anxiety and 35% suffering depression. So we are doing something very wrong. Four carefully designed, randomized, controlled intervention studies have shown some successful outcomes. Lilly used family conferences, this was in 2000, within 72 hours of admission to an ICU if the attending physician predicted that the patient was likely to die or to be in the ICU for more than five days, decreased the length of stay. So again, a family conference with the team talking about within 72 hours of admission, so proactive. Schneiderman, 2003, used proactive ethics consultations in seven hospitals, <coughs> decreased the ICU length of stay and the hospital length of stay with no increase in mortality rate between the control and the intervention, which basically can translate to saying, if we talk about it, we won't kill them. Campbell, Meg Campbell in Detroit, 2004, used a proactive palliative care consult for patients with dementia. Again, showed a decreased length of stay and decreased use of non-beneficial therapies. La Tourette in France in 2007 used family conferences using the value, which is actually something that came out of Randy Curtis's team's work in Seattle at Harborview, a big trauma hospital. Um, this was something we actually did one day when we were trying to come up with a, um, trying to translate our research into an, an acronym, came up with value. Um, and they used it then to have, so that their residents and physicians could pull something out of their pocket to remind themselves how to work in this family conference. Um, they, gave, they used that and a bereavement pamphlet. Probably one of the lowest communication interventions you could do. Um, and they showed clinically significant reductions in PTSD, anxiety, and depression among families. So, these successful intervention studies have several common features. That's the first one, talk. And the second one is early, often, direct, compassionate, interprofessional, and clinician-led. Clinician-initiated. We know that when we go to families and we have talked amongst ourselves first so that we are presenting a compassionate and consistent story. And I don't mean story as a fable, but rather as a clinical picture. <coughs> that these interventions, we have been found to be successful in delivering better care. So, where does that take us? What should we do next? both as clini a clinical community and as an ethics community. First of all, structures. Um, if you walk into any decent pediatric ICU, there's a bed for the family member. We acknowledge that children have families, but we don't acknowledge that adults have families. We need to recognize that 20% of Americans are going to die in an ICU, and we want their family by their bedside. Um, hospital birth, we have tried to make look like home birth. We have created the home birth experience in the hospital because that's what our communities wanted. We need to just recognize that 
and build ICUs that create the dying experience that our families want. Cultural. We need to create the habit of team talk around end of life. We need to create routine team meetings, that, again, this proactive, that are triggered by prospective factors, such as a greater than three day ICU stay, or particular diagnoses, so that we, or a palliative care consult, either an ethics consult or a palliative care consult, so that we create the opportunities for talk rather than waiting for the crisis to build. Education. If we have patients spending an extra week, an extra two weeks, or a month in an ICU because of the surgeon's skill, or the intensivist knowledge, or ventilator management, we would invest in continuing education to improve those skills. We would not tolerate that kind of incompetence. And yet, we have longer lengths of stay we have PTSD at incredible rates for our families. And we chalk it up to clinicians' individual styles. That's unacceptable. This isn't about style, this is about competence. And we need to change our communication skills training in our basic education and in our advanced education so that we produce the outcomes that our patients and families want. And then last, ethics. Ethics as a field. We need to stop focusing on futility policies. We know that they are disproportionately being applied to the very groups in the US who increasingly lack trust in healthcare, in the system, and in us. Instead, we need to focus our intellectual and our policy efforts towards the work that will increase trust. And I don't mean blind trust. I mean earned trust. Patients and families need to feel honored for their cultural and their religious beliefs, or they will not trust us to make honorable decisions. When patients and families have not received basic care throughout their lives, asthma treatment for their child, prescriptions that we prescribe for their elderly parents, care for hypertension for their spouses. When they come to us at the end of life and we say to them, trust us, there's nothing more we can do, they don't. So. What's the summary? This is, by the way, my favorite place on Earth, Yellowstone Park. It is the best place on Earth. Um, clinicians need the skills training, the cultural expectation, and the structural opportunities to talk with patients and families about end of life. Compassionately, in a timely way, and with sensitivity to culture and religious values. We have the data. We know many of the ways that we need to do this. Patients and families want us to lead this dance. They've told us that repeatedly. And we must learn to do it with grace and courage as a team. Ethics needs to do the important work of looking more deeply at the issues before, um, sorry, behind the growing right to live preferences and to focus on the antecedents of those preferences and on evidence-based solutions and put the futility stick away. Thank you very much. <laughs> the best part about a TED Talk style is we've got plenty of time. Bring it on. <laughs> say that the thank you, the cultural mistrust is so real. Um, I met with a patient last week and she's dealing with breast cancer. She is angry because she thought more could have been done other than a mammogram. She said, I just don't 
trust them, you know, because I'm black, yeah. not more was done. Yeah. And I hear that, you know, constantly, you know, uh, that culture mistrust is, is a real, it's a real issue. Thank you for sharing that. And this cultural mistrust and the feeling of something could have, something else could have been done. What we have to get past is saying, oh, it, but she, yeah, I bet she got everything possible. She got chemo, she got radiation, she got a mammogram. No, she did not. And I don't mean her in particular. I mean there is not a person with dark skin in this country who has not suffered from poor treatment, poor outcomes, a, a, a um, different type of, of uh, care. And all you have to do is look at the statistics. You can start with the IOM report and work your way up. And if you want to read a truly chilling study, read Janice Sabin's article that was published around um, differences in pain therapies for pediatric patients where children who are black, the only difference that was found in treatment was for pediatric patients where pain management was the issue for an open reduction of a femur fracture. Black children were less likely to get opioids and instead to get um, uh, non-steroidal anti-inflammatories. Mm -hmm. Now if that doesn't make you sit up and take notice and say, no, we're not racist, but we practice in organizations of institutional racism and we have to own it. Right, and when you're dealing with elderly, the elderly population is even harder because oh. they live through the Tuskegee experiments yes. and, and yes. things of that nature. Yes. It's harder for them to trust um, the health of the medical community. And we have to, we have to accept that. Yes. I just wanted to add to that that um, one of the things about you know, the idea of communication, <coughs> and I know it's implied as a category here, but what wasn't articulated is the listening. That, you know, it's one thing to talk to people and to be in an educational stance or even an ethical stance and, and dealing with patient population, families, and so forth. But as the narrative movement, I think, is, is shown, is that we need to get that reflection. Absolutely. We need to hear what the story is from you know, the health of the, the, the patients, their families. And then I think you do get a little bit more of a sense of what the cultural orientation is. Because I think as far as, far as the medical profession and the establishment is concerned, it needs to hear it. Yeah. Probably needs to hear it again and again. Yeah. yeah. So I think listening is a absolutely good, good communication is as much about good listening. In fact, we did a study where we um, video or audio taped 52 patient care conferences um, um, with teams, and it was reams of data, as you can imagine. Um, and we had already analyzed them using qualitative methodologies, and then one of the fellows decided to look just at what was the percent of time we talked, and I don't mean me particularly, it was the team that was interacting, um, and what was the percent of time the family was talking, and then we had measures for how satisfied were they with what the um, conference had done, how much did they trust the care providers, and how highly did they rate the care providers' um, communication. Okay, I'll sum the findings up really quickly. The more we listen, the higher they rate our communication skills, no matter what the length of the conference. It doesn't take longer. Just shut up and listen. And you will actually be rated higher for your communication skills. And the more they said that the conference met their needs, and the more they trusted. Yes? So what is that endpoint of this work? Because you can't get more as clinicians I do all the stuff. Are more likely to turn down pain center and then what more are you saying that the ocean on the clinician side like oh you should say well you know it is a person's choice and some people do have these wishes and we should just roll with it. So my crystal ball has been a little foggy lately. Um, but the end point um, we are not at the end of this. I think we're in a um, we've got another decade at least of this issue. Um, we are unique in the world in that England, I was visiting in England recently and talking about these issues, and they are not having this same, even though they're a very multi multicultural society, they're not having these same issues in the same way. Other countries are not having these same issues. 
So what is unique about America? Our funding structure, the way we finance health care. We have large proportions of our um, society that are not able to access even basic care, that cannot trust that they will get asthma care for their child. Um, if there's any reason I think we should be arguing for basic care all through life, is so that when people get to the end of life, they can trust us when we say, really, there's nothing more we can do. And I, that I am saying that completely apolitically. Um, I see the distrust too often as a clinical ethicist when I go in to talk with families. And they don't believe us, and they have good reason to not. So I would make that argument. Um, so that's one thing. Then the, your other question is, Will we have diversity of views? And I would say the answer is yes. How we're going to choose to address that as we go forward is an issue that we have not resolved as a country. Um, are, are we going to say, you know, the issue around brain death is a great example. Are we going to say that there are compassionate exceptions and that some people in America, we'll be able to not agree with brain death criteria. And, and we'll be able to have their family members kept on aggressive therapies until the body deteriorates to the point where those therapies no longer work. We have not resolved that. But if we could have a baseline, we'll begin to be able to have that discussion. Um, I think the incidents, if you look at the data, if we um, what we know is that if we handle religious issues better, if we involve religious values early on, the data is very clear that we actually um, do a better job then with end-of-life discussions and end-of-life decision-making. And people who have had their religious values addressed by the physician and care team are much more likely to then um, have shorter lengths of stay in the ICU at the end of life and all of that. Linda. So we often say what we measure, what we move is what we measure. And um, I'm wondering if you have any thoughts about how we can begin to shift the things that we measure as evidence of success in our our studies to get at some of these issues that you're highlighting. So what are the alternatives to what we're currently measuring? Um, Randy Curtis, my colleague um, in Seattle, has a quality of death and dying QODD scale that we've used with a number in a number of studies. Um, that's one way we give that to both nurses as um, to look at how is it viewed clinically, and then to the families um, about uh, a month after the patient's death. I think we get good information from that. We also get narrative. Um, we oftentimes include in that a question that says, what did we do particularly well, and what could we have done better? And the narratives are pretty poignant. Um, what we could do, uh, what we did particularly well is I'm sure what many of you have imagined. You've heard those good stories. What we could have done better would break your heart. And I, we did an intervention study with um, 12 or 13 hospitals, and I used to take that data back and present it to the team. And they, uh, some of the teams would say, I feel like we've been gut punched. You know, our families always seem so happy. You know, they seem grateful. And you're telling us this is what they're saying? So if we don't ask, they won't tell us. And then when we hear it, we need to not blame them for feeling that way. Yes? Um, maybe along the lines of, of um, the QD, we kind of talk in general about people at the end of life. Are there, are there scenarios or, or, say, certain health conditions? Because people go into ICU for lots of reasons. Yes. Where we do particularly poorly. I mean, I wonder, like, I'm an infectious disease doctor, so I wonder if that's often something that strikes people very acutely, where there wasn't mm -hmm. some buildup from there. I wonder if we can handle that more poorly rather than, say, longer chronic conditions that have sort of finally reached an ICU level, or, or is there no data on that? Oh, there's data on um, everything. <laughs> um, the, I don't know that particular. 
particular piece of data. I know one study where they looked at oncologists versus internal medicine cardiologists and a couple others around um, when do you bring up hospice in some standard scenarios, and oncologists were the ones who brought it up the last, the latest. So room for improvement there. Um, I don't know particularly. If you look at the support data, the um, outliers tended to be young, tended to have religious preferences for um, aggressive care at the end of life. Um, those were the two. But, but nothing by medical physician. No, there there definitely is data. I just, I, okay. Perfect. Yeah. Yes. Uh, in, in this country, I think it's unfortunate that politics has become very much enmeshed in, in the end of life uh, decision making and discussion. You just have to think about President Obama when he introduced the concept of uh, reimbursing people for having discussions, and it <coughs> turned into Obama's death penalty. Yes. Yes. And I would turn it back to us. We have a responsibility of changing that dialogue. Um, I think Obama has um, had courage to try to bring that forward. And I know for many of us, um, we don't want to be associated, you know, certainly as somebody who does ethics consultations, I don't want to be seen as the death patrol any more than I want to be seen as the ethics police. And so we tend to be fairly careful around our language in that, but I think we have to make some strong statements. And again, I would say this is, this is a, apolitical. This is about being able to have people trust us at the end of life because we've earned their trust throughout. So I, I know you have an interest in interprofessional work. Um, just, I just a teeny one. <laughs> I just um, finished a study as part of a larger project that we're doing on respect and dignity in the ICU, and I've done a bunch of focus groups of different kinds of clinicians. And one of the really, really powerful messages that, that I heard um, was that nurses felt frustrated by physicians inability or discomfort having these conversations. Mm -hmm. They notice that clinicians don't do it. There, there was an implication that, you know, we, we could do it. We're better at it, in fact, mm -hmm. and we don't have the authority to do mm -hmm. it. So the conversation doesn't get done because it's the people higher in the hierarchy that are charged with having those conversations, whereas I, I could do it better. So, I mean, mm -hmm. is there any hope for, for, for or, or to, to Cinda's point, you know, one of the things that we might want to be measuring and changing is there hope for sort of who, who is entitled to have those conversations? Well, so let me address, let me go back a little bit. Um, so Tony Bach and Randy Curtis uh, wrote a grant for a study where we did communication skills training with nurse practitioner students and internal medicine residents. And we did it um, as an interprofessional team to interprofessional learners. Um, over eight sessions, and it was probably my favorite study. Uh, so I did a lot of the teaching because I love that kind of stuff. Um, and, and here's the, the news. I know nurses say all the time, boy, I could even do this better. But in fact, they can't. Um, when you actually get people in the hot seats, they all are just perfectly horrible at it. Um, communication skills training is called that because it's like putting in an IV or doing surgery. You have to practice it. You can't get a lecture on how to break bad news and walk out and do a good job at it. I mean, if I could, I'm a kayaker, I could give you a lecture right now about how to roll your kayak, and I can guarantee you none of you would leave this room and be able to do it. We could have a little pool up here, and I could demonstrate it, and there'd be a couple of you who have particularly good motor skills who would be able to pick it up. But the way to teach you how to do a skill is you've got to all get in the pool and get your hair wet. It's the same with communication skills. We make this ridiculous assumption that we can talk at people about how to, to talk with their patients and families. And in fact, that's not the way you teach it. You've got to get them in the hot seat and let them find the words and practice and read and do it in a safe learning situation. So I know 
I, I hear this a lot too. Um, I can tell you, having trained both groups equally, it's hard. This is not called tough talk because, you know, for nothing, it's, it's difficult. Yes? So I'm going to state the obvious, um, but there are people on your team that have gone to school for this and that um, can do it with the physician, with the nurses, and they can tag team that conversation. Mm -hmm. It doesn't have to be done all alone with Troutman, your social workers, mental health people. They exist and we're here. We need all of you. So please use us <laughs> because it is the data supports you. Right. And it doesn't matter how you want it. You can make it fit your organization and your, you know, like who's on the bus. Um, it can be a, a proactive palliative care consult. It can be a um, team conference um, that's at a trigger point. You know, three days, after three days in the ICU, you have a, a, ma a mandatory, a regular team care conference. It doesn't matter. Basically, the message is get together and talk. And remember, we patients and families want us to lead the dance. They wait for us. Sarah, I want to thank you for all you did. Wonderful talk and, and a lot to think about. I wondered if you could speak a bit more when you um, mentioned the sort of isolation of the U.S. that we are different from other countries in this regard. And I wasn't sure about what the it was, mm -hmm. and I okay. also am wondering about the comparison with the UK, where there has been, on the one hand, historically there was a tradition of silent rationing that sort of came out in public, and now in our immediate time, a lot of controversy about whether the uh, whether the National Health Service is indeed covering everything that could be done. Mm -hmm. Uh, particularly for, for people for whom very, very expensive cancer interventions, biologics and so on, are in contention. But, so yes. what's the it that we're okay. that we're different from everybody else on? So the it is healthcare financing. Now, I know what the, you're saying the difference, but what's the, pro what's the problem that we're okay. having that, that nobody else is having? Okay. This problem of having a growing number of people who want more aggressive care at the end of life than most of us, meaning the healthcare community, would view as, as reasonable, appropriate, even um, medically indicated in any way. Um, when I first started into the field, when you looked at <coughs> research studies, there'd be four to eight percent, kind of regularly, of people wanted very aggressive care at the end of life. Now, those studies, it's eight to sixteen percent. It's basically double. Um, and this very dramatic change in terms of the proportion of where we die, of who wants aggressive care. This is what has changed. Is we moved from 1980 when, when things are re were relatively similar between different groups to now when we are growing in terms of our disparity. And that's how we're different. When you go to the UK or you go to other places, the difference between groups is much, much less. There is not. So, while you're absolutely right, while the um, National Health Service has a, a history of rationing and probably <laughs> is doing quite a bit of implicit rationing and explicit rationing, there isn't the feeling that I have been denied care because I couldn't afford it, or I have been denied care on the basis of race, or I have been denied care because my religion is not honored. And in this country, that is what we are contending with. And we've got a generation, at least, to overcome this. We need to earn the trust and make, help people to feel honored because we truly are acting on it. I'm, I'm also really interested in, in cross-cultural differences. And it, it seems like there are potentially many differences. It, certainly, yes. healthcare financing is a big one. Yeah. But I don't, I don't think it's the only one. I mean, I, I do think that we have a, a value system here about sort of 
do everything and every anything is possible and everything is possible and I think that to some extent there may be a hype associated with scientific discoveries in this country, maybe less in other countries, I don't know, but there, there, does, there does seem to be um, you know, just a, a general notion that somehow we, if we work hard enough, we could conquer mortality, you know, whereas, whereas mortality is, is believed to be more of a part of life in, in other cultures. So. So if you play that out, you know, I, I hear what you're saying, and if you play that out, you would expect that kind of a belief to be randomly distributed across Americans, or perhaps to be grouped among, uh, you know, scientists or among other groups, but it's not. In fact, the people whose preferences are for very aggressive care at the end of life are not represented by, by that type of a belief in science. It's represented by um, religious beliefs, by racial characteristics, and by socioeconomic, by being poor. Yeah, to continue that thought then, do we have empirical data on the relationship then between trust in the medical system and desire for intensive medical care at the end of life? Because it seems like we would need that that there are lower levels of trust in the medical system among African-Americans and low SES. Do, does that same pattern then hold also for those who desire greater intervention for medical services at the end of life? Do we see a lower level of trust in the medical system among those individuals? Um, I did a thesis on in my care of death and dying, titled Good Dying, and based on the literature, There is um, this mistrust um, in people who just want, just want to, based on religious tradition, just want to keep living. Because when you mention hospice, it's a sign that I'm giving up. I've had loved ones with stage four cancer, and you have someone come in that have been in remission from cancer, tell them, oh, you're going to live, you'll be fine because I got through it. And there's all this religious talk in two weeks this person died. So in my tradition, the African American community, when you mention anything about hospice and in life care, because of the mistrust, they want everything. We just had a case in California where this baby seemingly was dead because of some whatever. And they were not willing to let the child go. I don't know what happened you know, later on. But. So I, I think what I would answer you is there is so much evidence that it's um, hard to ignore, and yet what we do is we see it as this can't be true. Yeah. There's an assumption uh, in a number of things that you said that um, less ICU care and, and earlier hospice is always the, the right um, solution to um, I'm going to now separate out palliative care from hospice. Mm -hmm. um, uh, about a year ago, I couldn't have answered this question this way, but now we have a study that was done where palliative care, it was a randomized trial where palliative care was offered to people with lung cancer. Um, and those who had it offered earliest lived longest. So now I would have to say to you, the earlier, the better, in 
terms of outcomes. And we don't know for um, anything besides that disease, but there's reasons to think that the better we control symptoms, the more we're having coordinated care, which is one thing that palliative care brings to a team, um, the more we're having open discussions and are bringing patients' preferences and wishes into it, the longer patients may live and with higher quality of life. So I, I'm not trying to say a good outcome is no ICU and dying quicker. I, I don't believe that. Um, this is why this area of research is, is hard to get your outcomes figured out. So you said that in sort of the past 30 years there's been this doubling of people who want this more aggressive therapy mm -hmm. and the life and a lot of tests mm -hmm. the mistrust issue. I'm just wondering, it seems like the the underlying issues of you know who's getting their health care paid for and, and you know the system issues at least don't seem like they would have gotten that much worse. And I would think 30 years ago those were probably still pretty bad. So I'm just wondering, has there been an actual shift in, in the way things are being reimbursed and the, the care that people have access to in the past 30 years? You know, I'd look at all the other people in the room here with gray hair, and they can tell you yes. And the reason is care is much, much more expensive. Um, you're, the risk of not having insurance is much higher. Uh, when we look at what is the percent of people who declare bankruptcy that is linked to a medical um, illness, it's extremely high. I forget right now the number, but it's something like, it's certainly over 50%, somewhere between 50 and 75% of all bankruptcy, personal bankruptcies are linked to a um, medical condition. So the, the quick answer is yes, it's much worse. I'm sorry to bring such a cheery topic <laughs> to you, but what I hope that you are left with is the feeling that we have the data. We know what we need to do. Um, we know that proactive, timely, compassionate communication as an interprofessional team can help improve the PTSD for our families, can begin to address the trust issues that we simply have to face. We're not going to fix them in one generation, but we can sure begin to address them. We know that if we that we need to teach communication skills, we cannot expect our families to help us with this. They're in crisis. We need to recognize that this does not come naturally, no more naturally than rolling a kayak. We need to practice it, teach it, invest in it, just as we would invest in the surgeon to teach them the technique that allows their patients to heal twice as fast. And we need to, yeah. I have another comment on this. Please. Be quiet. Mm -hmm. I want to go back to the topic of saying that it's easier for nurses to tell patients that you're dying. And I've been in simulations and I've been here for a minute and it's frustrating to hear a doctor struggle with telling someone that you want to have a short period of time to live that you're going to die. I have been admitted for 20 some years. I've studied death and dying. And then I got a phone call. I had to go up the stairs and tell an employee that her dad died. I never had to do that. It terrified me that I had to go and give that information to that woman. So I agree, it takes practice. You don't just learn this overnight. I actually want to come back to this. So one, I want to be clear that what these nurses were also saying was that in many ways, uh, an end of, it's too late to have an end of life conversation at the end of life. Yeah. What, what these nurses were saying doctors were really bad at, that they are better at, is goals of care conversations. Mm -hmm. You know, so when <coughs> patients say that you repeatedly come back and back and back, and no one has ever talked to them about what they want and what's appropriate for them. And, you know, and we keep doing the same thing over and over again. Those sorts of conversations nurses seem to feel more comfortable having. 
and, and observed that those conversations were not ha happening because the doctors somehow thought that it was in there. There's a little bit of evidence to support that. Lynn Renke did a lovely study where she looked at nurses' um, roles and what families said about the nurses' role. And I'm trying to remember if patients were also in that. About um, what they did around end of life conversations. And it was before they were at the end, end of life. Um, so there is a little bit of evidence to support what you're saying. Um, again, I would go back to skills training across the team. It needs to be active skills training. The other kind of skills training that I'm, I'm involved in, because I like any conversation that makes everybody break out in hives, mm -hmm. um, is air disclosure. So we do a lot of teaching around how to disclose errors as a team because it usually takes a whole team to make the really big ones. Um, so we do simulated, um, use simulated family members to have teams practice how to talk about the error in a non-blaming way, get to, you know, decide that this really was an error, figure out how they're going to go to the family member or patient and talk about that error, and then to go in together and have a compassionate, honest, Disclosure that includes an apology with that patient and family member. And what the team say afterwards is, I will never do it alone again. <laughs> Boy, is it great having my colleague there with me. So, but it takes practice. Yes. Hi. Mm -hmm. Great talk. And I, I'm going to be a little bit of the oh. uh, disability thing because Marilyn said a good small version of Holt that came out in July. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of debate among legal counsel and clinicians mm -hmm. about how to interpret it. Mm -hmm. And so, I, it, from what I'm hearing, uh, some of the clinicians are filling out the mold kind of like a checklist of what would you like to say. And then mm -hmm. it re results in this frustration among the staff that even treatments that they don't think are going to be effectiveness are put on the table. And that we're even cases where they'll try to come up, these are the extreme scenarios mm -hmm. that we think aren't worth talking mm -hmm. about that you're, that you're suggesting we have. So, you've done everything you can do to the person in the IT that can't be discharged and we'll take them. And uh, they're using, you know, they're, from the staff perspective, they're using up the IT bed. Uh, what do we do about that? And so the compromise position is no escalation of treatment, but you have to attempt Make sure I'm clear. Taking the futility issue and having it there so that you can get at it. And my yeah. answer is no. I think it's a stick, and we'd rather use the stick than talk. Um, I'm going to end with a very quick story. My last ethics consult, I uh, got woken up on Sunday morning um, by the fellow saying, um, you know, sorry to call so early, but we've got a case that I could really use some help with. Um, it was a situation of a um, relatively young man, 32-year-old, with, um, at this point, he was very close to death. He was in the ICU on maximal 
life-sustaining therapy. He had initiated therapy a month earlier with great hopes that he would be able to um, have things resolve and um, recover. But uh, in fact, things had not gone that way. His mother was at the bedside. Um, a little of the backstory: she had lost her other adult child earlier in the year. Uh, when that, when they'd gone in to talk with her with regarding that, they'd had to call security. Um, so this was the scenario that I was called to, and the fellow said, "I'm, I'm really nervous. She's, she won't discuss CPR with us. We have gone to great efforts to have this particular rescue therapy." that we're going to do later uh, this afternoon. It put the person who was also involved in this rescue, and I'm kind of being vague purposefully, um, there was risk involved. The nurses raised the question of, should you even put another person at risk when there's absolutely no hope that this therapy will um, create any benefit? Um, and that's a good point. What should we be doing here? Could you help us? So I came in. Um, Jumped out of bed, got dressed, came in. Um, and we went, we talked first about how do we want to approach this conversation. And what the team wanted was a DNR order. So I said, how about we start this conversation by asking the mom what she's seen. And the fellow was re re um, re uh, willing to do that. Now remember, um, I've done a lot of communication teaching. So I can ask somebody almost anything um, and stay present with it. So we went in, we started with that, and the mother started into details, and the dog slipped into, let me clarify. And I stopped her and said, what we're wondering is what you're seeing when you look at him. And there was a friend there, and there was dead silence in the room, and the friend said, he's dying. And the mother backed away from the bed and yelled at the friend and said, I don't want to hear that. Don't say that kind of thing. Be quiet. And turned her back to the bed. Now, in body language, what she's done, she's disengaged from the conversation. And she was just a little writhing piece of pain. So I walked around on the other side, not getting between she and her son, and I said to her, you don't want to have this conversation, do you? And she said, no. And I said, you know what we have to talk about, don't you? And she, you know, eyes welled up and she said, yes. And I said, I'm so sorry that we need to talk about this. And she cried. And I said, from a little bit of a distance, can I give you a hug? When I told the medical director later about this, he said, you are lucky you didn't get clopped. Because um, she was a wiry little thing. Looked like she maybe had worked at a truck stop and knew how to handle it. Um, but she melted into my arms. And she didn't disengage. And after about a minute, I started to rock her. Because I thought, well, you know. <laughs> I've got to do something after about a minute, you know? And I rocked her for a while, and then she disengaged, and she walked back to the bed, and she took his hand, and she said, well, then what can we do? What can we do now? And we said, it's too late. We've done everything we could. And she said, what about this last therapy? Won't that help him? And we said, and I said, gone too far. He's too sick. In fact, we're afraid it may make him less comfortable. And then I said, we can't do CPR. When his heart stops, I, I said, we're not going to do CPR. When his heart stops, it won't be able to help him. She didn't say no. She just said, okay. And then she, I said, what is it you want now? And she said, I want him to live. And I said, so you want time. The translation of goal to reality. And she said, yes. And I said, we can, we can give you the time that he has. 
And the doc then, we, na we negotiated the exact orders. And then I said to her, and when you feel that you've had enough time, you can always ask us to remove the rest of this stuff. You can do that. And the doctor kind of looked at me like, you have got to be kidding, we got to win here. You know, like, <laughs> zip it. But you know, she called me a half an hour later, and she said, you were right. The mother just came out of the room, waved me down, and asked me to take the rest off. What I'd say to you is, so what's, what's behind that? It's moving towards pain. It's turning, and this is straight from Tony Curtis's work. He has a wonderful book um, on basic communication skills. It's turning from the cognitive channel to the emotional channel and just speaking to her emotions. And it's being willing to not fix it and be present in the pain. Um, these are teachable skills. I do it all the time. This is not like some magic thing I'm not blessed around my communication skills. I've learned everything I learned from my teenage daughter and Tony Bach. <laughs> <laughs> and, and both in equal measure. <laughs> we can all do this. We just have to value it and spend the money and time teaching our new clinicians and our ones in practice how to have the skills to address the very human moment of end of life.